Stress is God's way of training you. It's preparation. But what most people do is, see, once you get stressed, you don't want that no more. So now you give up, you through. Nobody likes stress because some people just let they self go. But you got to, in order to develop and to change and to grow, stress is necessary. So you got to be willing to go get it every day. There's a story my father told me all the time. Now I've heard it several different ways. He said, son, he said, every morning on the plains of the Eastern Serengeti Desert, there arises a gazelle that realizes that he was run faster than the fastest lion or he will be eaten and he will die that day. On that same desert arises in the morning a lion that realizes that he must run faster than the fastest gazelle or he will starve and he will die that day. He say, son, the moral of the story is, no matter who you is, when you wake up in the morning, you need to be running. Greatness. It's just something we made up. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is a gift reserved for a chosen few, for prodigies, for superstars. And the rest of us can only stand by watching. You can forget that. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. It's not some precious thing. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We're all capable of it. All of us. I always believe leaving no stone unturned. That's what makes you a champion. Sometimes the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now, what difference is it gonna make? You gotta be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You gotta be so smart that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment of philosophy, what's that gonna cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. I started working when I was 19. I met my teacher who helped turn my life around when I was 25, that's six years. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promises. I live in America. I'm 25 year old American male. I got a nice family, every reason to do well. And I'm messed up. Now what's messed up? I used to think it was the community that was messed up and the country was messed up and the government was messed up those Democrats ever get in the White House, that'll really mess things up. If the Republicans stay in power, that'll really mess things up. The economy was messed up, interest rates are messed up. I thought all this stuff was messed up. Then I found out that's not what was messed up. I was criticizing the only thing I had to work with. What was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment, in my own personal philosophy, brought me in six years two pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well, living in America, 25-year-old American male, got a family, every reason to do well. Now, once I understood this, here's the formula for failure, errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy, I'm telling you it's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. Guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar, or whether it's your money, or whether it's your cholesterol counts. All you got to do is commit the errors, and just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple. You say, well, I didn't eat an apple today, and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you gotta be brighter than that. Someday you gotta leave first grade. 
See, I'm a seed. I really am. I, see, but a seed has to be planted. A seed got to have dirt put on top of it. If you take a seed and throw it on the concrete and walk off, the sun just burn it up. But guess what? Logically, in my mind, it doesn't make sense that to grow something, you should dig a hole, put it down in there, and cover it with dirt. Logically, that don't make no sense to me. But oh, though. See, dirt is necessary for growth and development. Dirt builds character. Dirt, dirt gives you the push-through factor. Dirt makes you come with it when you don't feel like coming with it no more. And you get dirt in a lot of different ways. All of y'all that had dirt thrown on you. And dirt ain't always what you want. It's somebody talking about you down on your job. It's somebody accusing you of something that you didn't do. It's somebody telling you you ain't going to make it. It's somebody sharing information about you that ain't true. That everybody get dirt put on. But see, when you're getting put under that stress, please know God is always working. God is always working, so I smile. Because I know he back there. See, that dirt builds character in you. When they talking about you, it teaches you to withstand it. Then it gives you something to push through. So when you put the seed and you put the dirt on it, if you understand stress, stress really ain't just dirt. See, they don't call it dirt when they plant it. They call it soil. Because, see, soil has nutrients in it. What the nutrients, when people are talking about you, dogging you, lying on you, backbiting, stealing from you, talking about you, they're actually putting nutrients in you. When you're out there partying, washing around, someone out there at the same time is working hard. Someone is getting smarter and someone is winning. You never want to fail because you didn't work hard enough. But if you want to win, there's absolutely no way around hard, hard work. No pain, no gain. We're wired differently. We have to set a goal. And if we hit that goal, we're guaranteed to make sure all that other stuff in the middle is going to happen. Why three o'clock in the morning? Why don't you sleep? My appetite. My appetite. I said, PT, I want more. I can do more. If I accomplish this without a father, would I, if I accomplish this with my mom being a teenage mom, if I accomplish this as a high school dropout, how many of you believe in your life that your worst day can become your best day if you turn it around? Now let me give you the secret to success. Formula for failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month, starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in six years. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplines practice every day and you've started a whole new process called a whole new life a few simple disciplines practiced every day and if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar I'm telling you you have begun the process of turning your life around and if you keep up that process not only with your health habits but with your money habits and with your communication habits with your sales habits, management habits, and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with disciplines practiced. I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately. After today, you don't ever have to be the same again. Only by choice. You don't have to walk out of here the same as you walked in today. Only by choice. You can start a whole new process. And you say, well, Mr. Owen, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Where else would you start? but with an apple. You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health and you don't? What'll that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't, I mean don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn. And either one's called disaster. Could, should, don't. I'm telling you, that's why at the end of five years, I, six years, I found myself with pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, creditors calling. Could, should, won't. Could, should, don't is called disaster. Now, how do you change all that? The next six years, I got rich. The next six years, I became a millionaire. 
By the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. How about that? You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what happened? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. I'm telling you, taxes were about the same. My negative relatives were the same. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. Everything you see above ground that blossoms and plants and grows and that's beautiful, it was underground one time. All them potatoes, collard greens, they was underground one time. Them apple trees, they was underground one time. So they had to prove themselves. See, you want to be successful, well, then you got to prove yourself. You got to push through the dirt. You got to come up through here. You got to come out. Then you sprout. And then Bishop say, then you become a tree. Next thing you know, you got fruit. So when you under stress, take the stress for what it is. Don't get fooled. Don't just think, I don't know, man, Lord must not mean for it to be. What you tripping for? What you talking about? How you think you're going to be a plant, a tree, a flower, a bush, and ain't no stress? How you going to get to be that without no dirt? I expect people to talk about me. Matter of fact, I look forward to it now. Do your thing, because if I can weather what happened to me and my family earlier, you can bring whatever you got now. There's some more stuff going around now that's about to happen. Bring it. Because now I have developed a character that is stress. I have soil, enough dirt on me that is providing me with nutrients. that every day you thought you wasn't gonna make it do you remember them days where you thought it was absolutely unbearable and you thought you wasn't gonna endure that one do you know that your survival rate for every last one of them bad days is 100 percent if i can accomplish these things from this start now that i'm at this place knowing what i know now what can i count and i want you to think about that I want you to think about more than just what you're going to do financially, more than what you're going to do in this industry in the next three years, right? More than that, what's your appetite? What are you, what are you going to do that will in, ensure that when the alarm clock goes off, that you're already up 10, 20 minutes before your alarm clock goes off? Why? You got to grind, grind, grind. You got to go through setbacks and disappointments. You got to go through it. I'm talking about grit. I'm talking about endurance. Just having more stamina than they got. In order to get to the next level, you gotta sacrifice. You gotta take risks. You gotta be willing to do by faith whatever you're asked to do. Listen to me, there are no shortcuts to success. There are no discounts to success. It's always sweat. It's always blood. It's always tears. You always have to give all to be the best. All you got to do is start changing the way you think. It's as simple as, it's not a magic trick. You can protect yourself from negativity. And that's what stops most people, negative thoughts. You can coat your mind from negativity. It's a real simple exercise to do. I do it every morning before I walk out the door. So I walk out as a positive person. You know, I get tired sometimes. That's different from being negative because I get mentally drained from my job at times. But to coach your mind from negativity, the way you can put a coating around your mind is with one simple thing, gratitude. Gratitude erases negativity. I'm gonna show you how this works. If you wake up in the morning, you start having negative thoughts. Man, this ain't my day. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm tripping, I just don't feel myself. Every time you feel, in the middle of the day, if you feel yourself doing that, stop, just stop for a second and start going over in your mind everything you have to be grateful for. Not everything you want, everything you already have, because what you have is substantial. You just haven't gone over the list and taken inventory in a long time. But the fact that you can walk, that's a blessing. The fact that you woke up, that's another blessing. The fact that you can see, think, reason, 
that's another blessing. The fact that you can go somewhere and get yourself something to eat, that's another blessing. The fact that you can go and turn the key and call someplace home, that's another blessing. The ability to dream is a blessing. The, the, the fact that you have an opportunity to get it right is another blessing. The fact that you're beautiful, that's another blessing. The fact that you have any measure of health, that's another blessing. And I'm just talking to you, I don't even know you. I could give you 50 things you ought to be grateful for right now. I don't even know you. Start coating your mind with gratitude. It'll change everything for you. When there's no safety net, people perform better in sports and everything else if you don't have a plan B. So we have to pay more attention to the negative because the negative can stop people who are trying to make a difficult life decision. And maybe we don't need 10,000 hours of practicing courage, but we could become cognizant of how we let fear manifest itself in our daily lives and instead counteract that so we could get past our fears and do the things that we're meant to do and be the people we're meant to be. See, if you know what your life work is, I encourage you to start working on it. If you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. A, a lot of people are looking at this the wrong way. There is a blessing in everything. Behind every moment of adversity in your life, there is a blessing and a lesson. You can be afraid of success. You can be afraid of failure. You can be afraid of looking ridiculous. You can be afraid of change, either positive or negative change. The only way to deal with fear that I found in my life is a couple ways. One of those ways is to turn it on itself. If you're not getting get rid of fear, then use fear. Use fear or it uses you. It's that simple. And there was something that had been on my heart and something that I had been thinking about but had long let fear get in the way of. And in doing so, I realized that, that I had come into a whole new world. I had come up with my plan for how I was going to change the world. About the things that you do that you shouldn't do, that you know you shouldn't do beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? There's some things like that. That's bad habits and poor aim and all of the resentment and hatred and aggression and unresolved conflicts and all those things that are dementing you and warping you and then think, okay, those things get the upper hand, man. They get the upper hand and they take you the worst possible place you could go. You, know, you don't magnify the degree to which the pain ought to be affecting you. And so really what he means in that is, listen, you're gonna get out of your life what you'll accept. And that's really difficult for people, I think, to understand is, look, what you think you're worth and what you're gonna tolerate is absolutely what you're gonna bring into your life and what the outward part of your life's gonna look like. So I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you wanna go, if you wanna make it today, and things are changing so fast, you have to literally run to stand still, I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Where well, I was going to be doing a lot of things that scared me all the time, and it's something that over the past year and a half of my life I have been so grateful for, especially because I've been able to live my mantra. I've been designing and redesigning and redesigning and redesigning, right? Um, and looking at the blueprint called me and what works and what doesn't work and embracing what works and embracing what didn't work. Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life. Within a six year period, I was never the same. And I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday. Somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. Guess what I want people to say? I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you the man works on his craft. I'm telling you the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like he does. Same thing can happen for you as a teenager. It can happen to you as a mother, as a father, as a business person, as a salesperson, running a business, doesn't matter. Management, wherever you find yourself, this is the process called personal change. And what I say to start with is start with your own philosophy. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines 
or continue the errors that's called potential disaster. And everybody has it within their power. Well, we're so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Shove said, Mr. Rohn, you don't have to change country. But you do have to change philosophy. And if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income, you can turn around your bank account, you can turn around your skills, you can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life using the only stuff there is and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Now I could spend the whole day on philosophy. That's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you would pick up the commitment like I did and say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you gonna start? We're affected by how we feel. First, we're affected by what we know and the decisions we, and the decisions we make. Second, we're affected by attitude, how we feel. And I gave that quick list, let me give it to you. It's how you feel about the past. You gotta have a good attitude about the past. Use it as a school, not a club. Don't beat yourself to death with your past. Faults, failures, losses. Let the past be a school, harsh school maybe. What else is new? Let the past be a school master to teach you. Not to threaten you, but to teach you. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Set your goals. We'll talk a little bit about that before we finish today. Goal setting. The promise of the future is an awesome force to affect your life every day. Without a future well-designed, we take hesitant steps. And all you have to have is hesitant steps for six years. You'll be timid, driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go and take your portion, take your share. Okay. Next is how you feel about everybody else. You gotta have a good attitude about everybody else because it takes everybody else to make a market. One person doesn't make a family. One person doesn't make a business. One person doesn't make a corporation. One person doesn't make a community. One person doesn't make a nation. It takes all of us to make a dynamic economy, a nation second to none. It takes all of us to make the churches, make the economy run. It takes all of us to make the possibilities. All the gifts that have flowed in here the last 200 years, unprecedented in six and a half thousand years of recorded history. There's been nothing like it. The ethnic streams that have flowed in here brought their gifts brought their talent, brought their skills, brought their inventions, brought their work ethic, all of it mixed together is called America. Been nothing like it in six and a half thousand years. And to miss the value of it by some, you know, warped attitude about it, I'm telling you, you've missed it all. And if you have an appreciation for it all, you'll draw from it. And if you draw from all the gifts that have been blended together here for 200 years, now for your value and benefit, think of what you can do for your days, for your business, for your conversation, for your equities. You can transform it to an incredible degree. So we're going to talk about just recognizing our ego when it shows up, because for me, either someone else points it out to me, close to me, or I see it in myself. If you have to wait around for other people to tell you, hey, your ego's out of control, it's too late usually. But to, 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 to look at people who are better than you and know they had to have sucked at one point in time. Okay, there's got to be there's somewhere along the end of this tunnel, there's got to be a light. I just got to keep going. That's what life is. It's always going to be about business. Business is not a game. Business is business. And that's what your life is about. If you put in the work, they can't stop you. Don't you realize that you are no? Don't you realize that you are special? Don't you realize you were put it for a reason? Because you were born to prosper be. Great pursue your own version of happiness that's wrapped in your capacity. Your ability to believe in a dream even. If nobody believes in you, it's two people born in the hospital every day. It's a person, a 
that's born in a hospital that's going to get a job. Somebody born in a hospital that's going to give them a job. So we've got to be able to see our ego when it rears its head, be aware of it, and it loses its power over us. We can go back to being our real selves, which is point one today. You can't love yourself if you're not being yourself. You can't love yourself if you're not being yourself. And when our ego shows up, in a minute, I'm going to show you some not so subtle ways egos show up. And you're going to see what I mean about maybe your ego is present. But remember this, when ego shows up, we're not ourselves. We're not connected to God. In other words, if you can let go of your ego, you can let God in. When you can let go of your ego, you can let your real confidence in. When you let go of your ego, you can go really become who you were born to be. And so oftentimes, this is so important you get. You may be losing right now because of your ego. Because of your ego. Because you're not feeling good about yourself. Yeah. And that no, takes no. ego, and, and right? Ego, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, ego drives you know you to be successful me to be successful ego is what's driving you the problem is when you let ego go too far yeah and you know everything you know everything takes balance I mean, there's a dichotomy in everything every part of you has a dichotomy you know you can get so into the physical aspects of things that you end up like doing a bunch of steroids and going crazy and ruining your health right yeah. that's that's not good right the other end of the spectrum you know you can sit around and play video games and turn into a Bodybuilding is a great example of that because when you start lifting weights, you're like, God, ah, I'd like to be stronger. And so let's get into some of the things that are indicative of big egos. The really obvious ones that I want you to look at when they rear their head sometimes for you or others. But then we're going to go to the not so obvious ones and then we'll talk about a solution. So here we go. Here are some of the signs that your ego is taking over in your life. Number one, defensiveness. It's not one you think of, is it? Defensiveness. You ever meet somebody who's very defensive, very reactive? about whatever their situation is or whatever you're asking them about, their ego is rearing its head. Sometimes we need to respond to criticism to get better and when we're defensive about it, that's our ego rearing its head. So in yourself and in other people, do you see any defensiveness patterns for you? This is an ego issue. Number two thing that's ego issue is always trying to be right or prove what you're saying to be true in excess. If you ever meet somebody who's kind of going out of their way to prove what they're saying is true, this is usually their ego taking over because they know what they're saying may not be true, and this is their ego rearing its head. The second thing is the need to always win in a disagreement, the need to always win in a fight. You start getting a little bit bigger, you're like, oh, look at that, I got a muscle, Woo, this is cool, and then you keep going, and then you keep going, but some guys get so, they won't stop until they have 22 inch arms, and they want to have thighs that are so big, they have to walk like they're, they've got a barrel in between their legs, and you know, and they, they just can't help it, they just take it to some completely unhealthy place. Yeah, that's, uh, that's rough. Yeah, well, it's, it's just the nature of trying to get good at something. You got to recognize what's good and what is just for some people, especially they're just experiencing way too much pressure and that that pressure. A lot of times it's just a, an imbalance in perspective. And some of it's in, like uh, I was talking to this mom once uh, her daughter uh, does gymnastics with my daughter and we were talking about um, kids killing themselves where she used to live. She used to live in um, one of the really wealthy tech areas outside of San Francisco and a bunch of kids that went to school with her daughter that were like 15, 16, were jumping off bridges and shit. Like it was a, a like an epidemic. You get to decide which one. I want you to take a long hard look at the people you surround yourself with you can't expect to become a millionaire when you're hanging out with drug addicts cannot expect to become the absolute highest level version of yourself. Surround yourself with people that never want to see you do better than them. Wake up the goals that you want to achieve. You hear people say all the time, nothing personal, it's just business. That's true. You got to bury your emotions and you got to be about your business. You got to be about the action. And if you put the action out there, then you will get a reaction. Let's just make sure that the reaction it's productive and it's getting you in the position that you need to be. Action is important. Words are words. Action gets things done. Are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to take it to the level and beyond? Or are you going to sit around and wait for someone to push you? Or are you going to push yourself? Or are you going to have the right attitude to drive yourself to that level and go beyond it? Or you're gonna just make excuses. They bitch about not having time. They 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 bitch about their boss. They bitch about their husband. They bitch about their lives. They bitch about everything. 
Some people even follow me on Instagram and bitch about me. We bitch about everything in life, but we do nothing about it. Very few people do anything about it. I'm fat, I'm out of shape. What are you doing about it? You gotta take action in your life. You gotta stop bitching. Find a solution, don't be the problem. Take action. For every action, there's an opposite reaction. If all you do is bitch, nothing's gonna happen in your life. Take action, take control, stay hard. Life's about improvise, adapt, and overcome to every situation that's in front of you. A lot of people hate that message that I say continue pushing, continue finding new 100%, continue finding your best self, not making excuses. Goals and nobody else sees hundreds of people give up on their goals on a daily basis. And it's usually because they realized quickly after starting their journeys that they're alone. Nobody is waking them up in the morning music. Nobody's pushing them when they start to make excuses. And nobody's patting them on the back when they hit milestones. So whatever you want to achieve in life, maybe it's losing a certain amount of weight to become the best version of it. That's all you hear about, is I am not going to do or I cannot do. That's all you hear most of the times. People are too busy putting themselves in a position where they don't want to go to the next level because it's too hard. I don't think I got it. I don't think I can do it. I'm not strong enough. Better you than me. You and me are two different people. You're not like everyone else. You're special, I'm special, we're all special, we're all unique. But you've got to put the action to work. Do something that's going to change something within your ideas and your mindset. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Every single day of my life, I wake up to a new idea and what I need to do with myself. But for me and for you, there are two different paths. Everybody's got to go in a certain direction. Overcoming any and all obstacles. Where do we start? You start right here. When do you start? You start right now. You initiate action. You go. Between the moment when you are waiting to do something that you don't want to do, and the first motion, and the moment when you initiate the action, all the interim, the whole time you are waiting to take that action, is like a phantasma or a hideous dream is like an evil specter, an apparition, a nightmare. So the battle, the struggle, the hesitation takes place in that moment. That moment when we must step into the unknown. That moment filled with fear and horror. And that fear is what causes hesitation and hesitation causes defeat. Maybe it's building a business to provide financial freedom for your family and to travel the world. Or maybe it's just being a better father, mother or partner for your spouse. Whatever it is, it's all on you. And the quicker you realize that, nobody's going to come and hold your hand through life through this journey. The faster you will start to see success. Stop relying on outside sources of inspiration, motivation and support. Get you there. got eight years of life by the way just so you know you only live eight years average person lives 78 you spend 28 of those years sleeping you spend 10 and a half to 12 of them working you spend another three or four shopping chores internet traffic add it up you get eight years and you're not a newborn so you got less than that you got to get in a hurry to make a difference in your life time is running out like that i'm fired up are you fired up probably didn't know we were going there. When I was a kid growing up, I don't know if you had this, my mom had the good china in a china cabinet. We had this furniture in the living room that was wrapped with cellophane that we weren't allowed to sit on until important people came over. Anybody have any of that in their house? We never got around to sitting on it and it died and got stale and old and dated and so do dreams. If you don't start getting after your dream, it'll get old and dated and stale because you keep 
wrapping it in cellophane. You keep waiting till you know a little more. Till I know a little more. Till I know a little more. If I just knew a little more, that's BS. You don't need to know a little more. You need to execute a little more. You need to get after it. You need to make some mistakes. Perfection is the lowest possible standard. Quit trying to be perfect. You don't need to know everything. The best people I know in business, they take action when they don't know everything. They learn what they can and they go execute. They make a mess. Being an entrepreneur is messy. You need to embrace the mess. Embrace the chaos. You're never going to know everything you think you need to know. That's why me, my low IQ, and I'm not kidding when I say that, is to some extent an advantage. I don't think about all the stuff I don't need to know. I started on social media two years ago. I'm the number one growth person in the history of business on social media, according to Forbes magazine. The way it started, Tony Robbins sitting on my balcony says, you need to get into this space. There's nobody that's an heir apparent. You're a better speaker than me. You know more of this stuff than me. And all these other clowns don't know what they're talking about. Get in the space. I said, I don't want to do that. I'm shy. I'm introverted. I just like speaking on the stage and leaving. I don't want to be posting stuff every day. He goes, that's why you're an effing loser. Right on my balcony, on that copper house you seen there. I said, I'm a loser. He goes, yeah, you say you want to help all these people, but you don't want to be inconvenienced to do it. I said, dude, I don't even know how this stuff works. He's like, you think I know all this stuff works? Just start, dumbass. My son was in the kitchen. I said, Max, go get your phone. How do you do this thing? He goes, dad, you need an account. I go, set me up one. He comes back five minutes later. He goes, I got you an Instagram account. I go, okay, good. I'm going to do one of those videos. And he literally goes, it have to be a minute. I said, a minute? I don't even clear my throat in a minute. How the hell am I going to make a message to me? He goes, just do it. And I said, blah, 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 post that one. Next day, I got three followers and three likes. I call Tony. I go, this crap isn't working. He goes, you've done one message, dumbass. He goes, by the way, post earlier in the morning, like around breakfast time. I'm on my boat driving to his house. I go, okay, breakfast time. And then I hear him say, I swear to you, this is true. I hear him say, what I hear is he goes, you need to post early, like around breakfast time and make sure you add some hash, to, hash browns to that. And I don't want to be embarrassed and act like I don't know anymore. So I call my son and I said, hey, you said you knew what you were doing on this stuff. Where the hell are the hash browns on this post? And I'm not playing around. If you don't know, I'll hire somebody who does. You're 15, you should know how this stuff works. He goes, dad, I don't, I go, you're supposed to post at breakfast time and somehow there's hash browns involved hashtags. And then Tony was my first guest. Then I recorded my first podcast. Listen to me. This will relate to you. And then I'm going to get into some detail. So I said, Tony, what do you, how do you do one? He goes, I don't know. Google it. I'm the number one podcast in the world now. Tony, Grant, Gary V combined left downloads than me. They've been doing it for years. I've been doing it for like 18 months. Why is that? By the way, you should be listening to my podcast. Okay. Why, why, why? So I literally, this is literally what happens. I go, how do you say it? He goes, what the hell, Tony? Like, Tony's like, what are you talking about? How do you say it where it gets in your computer? Because you probably need a microphone dude I don't know Google it so I Google how to start a podcast Tim Ferriss turns out had, I didn't even know who that was had an audio on how to start a podcast I listened to the audio he says go to Amazon I got a kit the microphone the recorder that other stuff so I ordered Tim Ferriss's kit right I get it to my house I plug the mic in I stick it and I talk for like 30 minutes my first podcast and then I'm done and I call Tony I go hey I get it how does it get out of that box into the world he goes I think you need to take that stick out and stick it in your computer I'm on the phone with him I go okay it's in there he goes save it I go okay it's on the computer okay cool and we hang on up. And then like an hour later, I go, so how would, how do people know that's in my computer? You think I'm kidding? I swear to God. How do I know this is in my, how do, and I call, I go, Hey, how's it get out of my computer into the, you know, the internet? He's like, I don't, I don't know that part either. I just record when my team does it. I, I go, I don't have a team. I got Max. He doesn't even know about hash browns. And then I finally figured out he had to host things. Do you think if, if I waited around to know everything, this would not have happened. You take action. The Lord has a way when you step into a new space of revealing to you the people, places, resources, and things you need in that space. And you go from there and you go to the next one. I have a great friend of mine named Carl Edwards was a NASCAR driver. I drove his, I sponsored his car for a number of years. And he said, the scariest thing in NASCAR is when there's a crash in front of you, we are trained to drive right into the smoke. The challenges of life. How do we get it? How do we get stuck? A friend of mine went through a divorce. My best friend. He had a wife that did not love him as much as he loved her. It was his first real true love. He was a very religious man, did not believe in divorce. He made a mistake and he paid for his mistake with a lot of pain, a lot of tears. And there came to a point where he knew he should have gotten a divorce, but he was stuck. He was stuck in something called revenge. He said, she's made me so miserable, I'm going to pay her back. He was stuck. And he stayed in there longer than he should have because it began to uh, attack him. It began to affect him psychologically. And as a result of that, when he eventually did get a divorce, he took that same attitude to other relationships, looking for something to go wrong. He was burned so badly, he did not want to risk pain again. He was going in relationships trying to avoid pain. When it became too close, he would do something to make sure the relationship did not work. He would always try and find something wrong with the person because there are no perfect people. 
so if you look for it, you can find it. He was stuck in revenge. Another friend of mine, working on a job, loved the company very much, expected to retire there. And one day they call him in the office, ask him for his badge and identification, told the security man up, walked into his desk, told him he was fired and he had to leave then. He was devastated. And if you came anywhere near him, he will tell you his story, as we all have stories. Even when he got a job, he went on the job telling anybody who would listen how they fired him unjustly. And he always ended with, it wasn't fair. Life isn't fair. Life just is. It's not fair that birds eat worms, and they do. The Bible said be quiet, Solomon. Finding a still place where you can hear that little voice that directs traffic in your life. It's like the navigational system in my car. It says, down two blocks and turn left. And that works real good until I turn the music up too loud. And when I, because I'm, you know, I'm out of the city. You know, so I turn the music up until you have a hearing deficit, you know, and I'm trying to hear direction, but the music is so loud. Now in my new car, it just cuts it down for me right in the middle of the song. <laughs> turn left at the corner. Yeah, and sometimes God has to turn the music down for you because everything's turned up too loud and God has to turn it down and bring you to your knees where you can hear the still voice. That's what started you. That's what called you. That's what inspired you. Don't let the noise of life or the noise of success or the noise of struggles or the noise of popularity become so loud that you lose your ability to hear the still small voice. For preachers, we think that we are speakers. And let me give you just the key to speaking. People who do not hear right and not speak. Have you ever noticed that deaf people talk funny? They talk funny because they hear funny. You talk funny when you like. So he's back up in the cave again and then the still small voice speaks in his life and begins to give him directions. You would be shocked how many leaders live in the cave. Leaders have a tendency to be cavemen. Cavemen, that's why you want it done. Suddenly, way, do it this way or get out of here. Cavemen, got a club, getting it done. Only time you're nice is on stage. People who work with you behind the scenes know that you are demanding and egotistical and self-centered and stressed out. And when you want it, you want it the way you want it. Boom, you came, man. This is my last day. I get nasty now. Fundamentals form the beginning, the basis, the reality from which everything else flows. And remember, there are no new fundamentals. Fundamentals are old, well-established. Beware of someone who claims to have a new fundamental. That's like someone who claims to manufacture antiques. We would have to be suspicious, right? So fundamentals, basics, they are so very important to understand and consider and practice if you wish for the good life. And may I add here, make sure you don't go looking for the exotic answers to success. Success is a very basic process. It doesn't fall out of the sky. It doesn't have any mysteries, nor does it fall into the realm of the miraculous. Success is merely a natural result that comes from the consistent operation of the practical fundamentals. As someone wisely remarked, to be successful, you don't have to do extraordinary things. Just do ordinary things extraordinarily well. Mr. Schoff, my teacher, gave me many great phrases I'll always remember. One of them was, there are always about a half dozen things that make 80% of the difference. What a key thought, a half dozen things. Whether we are working on our health, wealth, personal goals, or professional enterprise, the difference between our ultimate success or inevitable failure lies in the degree to which we are willing to seek out, study, and to go to work on those half dozen things. For a farmer to reap a plentiful harvest in the fall, for example, the major basics are fairly obvious. Soil, seed, water, sunshine, nourishment, and care. Each fundamental being equally in need of study and attention, for together they bring about the best chance for a successful harvest.